Hello, this is Damien Marie Athope, and I am an axiological atheist, which is a value theory or a value science atheist, which can easily be understood as a moral argument driven and an ethical reasoned form of atheism. But anyways, I want to address today is I want to address dialectic questions. And I want to explain why I want to do this, because I want to show that you can use rationalism and purely, in a sense, rationalism, of course, a appealing to naturalism and um, uh, stuff like um, the epistemic accuracy of the world around us. Uh, anyways, so I want to address is the error-crushing force of the dialectic questions in, in general, and the hammer of truth. And what I mean by the hammer of truth, what I mean is the epistemic weight that we bear on another person, in a sense, almost like holding them accountable to what they say, what they believe, the propositions that they offer. And when we do this, they feel the weight of the inaccuracy that they may um, have not even realized that they are having inside of their beliefs or that actually are contained in the belief itself. This also needs to be understood as not something that we just use against others, but any true and honest thinker should be using this against themselves because it's not that it's a... Um, a tool that we use destructively, this hammer of truth, we build an architecture of accuracy in our beliefs and in the things that we think or the things that we believe that we know. So number one in the, to me, the, my um, examples of dialectic questions address um, ontology. And ontology is the thingness of things. It's kind of like a, um, type of a description almost, but it, it involves the characteristics and qualities that are inside of a thing. So the question should be, what are you talking about? And when you say, what are you talking about? What you're really referring to is like, what is the thingness of the thing they're talking about? So if I say, um, I, uh, I know what truth is. Your question should be thinking, well, what are you talking about? What is truth? And then you, you're asking me to give um, a, a analysis or an explanation or a, um, a further uh, expression of what that is meaning to me. And we want to find this out because often people are hasty in how they generalize ideas. And so when they generalize an idea, they may have what they believe and even could be possibly a loose idea of what is being talked about. But that doesn't mean they actually have the accurate thing. Because, I mean, there's a big difference between 10 and uh, 0. And so there is a real accuracy issue that often to me uh, in, um, in beliefs, including our ones that we hold ourselves, that could be uh, up for challenge. And to me, anything that, that is there that is inaccurate should be challenged. Any good thinker should want the challenge. So again, ontology. What are you talking about? And this is what you should be thinking or saying. Please slow down and give me the specific detailed individually. So you want a person, so if I said truth and I started giving you all kinds of different propositions, you want to slow it down and say, it's like if someone says, well, I know there's a God because you slow them down and say, hold on a second, what's a God? Now, I don't mean what's a God like as in definition of the God, a God is a being that has power. I mean, when you say that there is a being with power, what are you saying? When you're saying that, well, this being has a superpower. Okay, what's a superpower? How would we know that that was happening? Because what we're trying to do is hold them accountable 
to propositions or beliefs or ideas that they're stating. The reason why, because then they can be scrutinized with them in a way of teaching and um, truth finding, in a sense, together. In other words, to me, what the best dialectic question that I'm offering is not so much one that I'm telling them this is just what something is. I'm telling them, how can you say it's anything but this? Or I'm saying, tell me what it is you're trying to say, and then I'm going to hold you accountable to that statement. So the next thing that to address is epistemology. And this is like the question, how do you know what you're saying? How do you know that? You're requiring, you're holding them accountable to offer the epistemology of the ontology they just offered. So the belief, the proposition, the idea, whatever explanation that they offered, you're now saying, okay, now that we know what you are offering, and you're holding them now accountable, they cannot, in a sense, change, you know, um, without being just dishonest. They can't change their their statement. You've now, you're on solid ground. See, on solid ground like that, we can then bring a lot of propositions to bear against that idea. We can, in other words, challenge it, attack it. We can expose it. We can, we can highlight it. So the epistemology helps us do this, helps us expose the ontology that they offered or the ontology that's, that's existing, the thingness of the thing that they're talking about. So the ontology, the, the epistemology wants to know what, 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 what makes you think that this is so? You know, what, what is, what is giving you the reasoning? So epistemology, how do you know that? And then we should think, why do you think that it's justified or warranted? Or we should be saying, why do you think it is justified or warranted? In other words, you don't want to just hear, well, the, like, just say, I believe in God, right? A, 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 a theist would say. And then we ask them, so that, then we ask them, what's the ontology of God? They say, well, God is, this thing exists, exists, you know, outside of space and time and has all these other qualities. So once they give us all these qualities, then we ask them the epistemology. How do you know that? And then further than just how do they think they know that, like they'll say, well, because the, let's just say, uh, Christian, the Bible tells me. But then we're further wanting to know, why do you think that claim of why you know that is justified? How is it warranted? How is it given, you know, um, a rationale to what you're saying? This is what epistemology is trying to do with the questions. The dialectical questions of epistemology. Next is the axiology, the dialectical questions of axiology. And axiology is basically wanting to know the value. It's like um, wanting to see your superstructure that you place on the world and how you break down the value of things. And it also um, wants to assess the real value of things, especially as far as their usefulness. Because in a sense, the difference between a cup and just um, paper in a different shape is the cup, the concept cup, the axiology of the value of, a, of the concept of cup means that it's able to, in a sense, we're talking about something that can hold, say, a liquid. So just a tubular thing that's in the shape of a cup, that's made of paper, and cannot hold water would not be a cup. And anyone who said it was a cup, they're actually being dishonest, even though it could be the same shape, in a sense, of what a cup would be. So what we're really asking about is the value. And that's what I'm trying to refer right there is the, what, what's the difference between something that just appears pseudo cup, fake cup, false cup, and real cup is the value that it has of containing or holding liquid. Or it could be other things, but for, I'm just thinking particularly about water. Because I guess you could have a container that can hold something that's non, you know, liquid based. And um, possibly even some paper could uh, 
um, the shape of a cup could hold it. But I'm really saying the value as it relates to a drinking thing. So we had to understand that there's properties of things. And even like I was did it there is you saw I slowed down and I was trying to create a higher level of accuracy and how I'm even thinking about what a concept of what equals a cup. And in general, that's what we should be doing is slowing down and thinking, 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 reassessing, analyzing, not making hasty generalizations. And even if we do, stepping back, are we sure? Can we justify it? Do the same thing ontologically. We make a generalization. We should think, what are we talking about? And then, then trying to get the most specific particular detail individually for each and every issue. And on each and every issue, we want to know the epistemology. Are they justified? How do we know that? Is it warranted on each and every issue? In other words, let's just say that we can prove that the, the God um, concept has to have 10 things. But if we can only prove one of the 10 things fits reality, we wouldn't say that that is achieved the level of accuracy of what would then be able to be called God. And the reason why value also is an important in this area, because it's not like every truth has the equal value. And I'm not even just talking about use. I'm talking about there's levels of things. There's, in other words, like what I mean by that the word value, I'm talking about accuracy. There's levels of accuracy. Some things certainly are more accurate than some things are less accurate. Including you could take two definitions straight out of the of different dictionaries, and there could be different definitions offered that are more accurate to the topic or less accurate. And so this is why value in a sense of accuracy, worth, goodness, you're 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 assessing harmony, disharmony, you're assessing the actual status um, of a thing when I, when you say value at least as it relates to axiology. So if you don't already know it, um, dialectic is the art of investigating or discussing the truth of opinions, beliefs, or ideas. What I'm trying to say, though, in the understanding of the message that I'm offering about the dialectic questions, in order for us to find and more accurately gain the understanding of what we call truth, we do this to me, and I'm, or I'm trying to do, I guess, in this little explanation, is give you or give people, you know, kind of like the three basic questions and three um, things that you're addressing to focus our thinking and focus your ability to actually find truth. And, you know, it also helps and almost everything to help remove errors and help to improve, once again, our accuracy. So to me, ontology, epistemology, and axiology are actually like a trifecta of um, truth enriching um, uh, protocol uh, elements. So we do need to really grasp uh, the ontology of truth, and then we need to grasp the epistemology of what truth could be. We need to understand what the axiology of truth could be. But in general, to me, the word truth, in a sense, is like a value judgment that we place on what we believe is evidence of something, is the justification, the warrant of something. So that's what we say when we say truth. It's equaled some status because it's it's um, achieved something, it's done something, or it relates directly to something. But in general, you know, understand how um, ontology works. You know, it evolves a more of a systematic and a um, a rationalistic to me understanding because you have to see the um, mental grid. Uh, that's not there. In a sense, it, it it's allowing us to um, place everything, you know, almost like on a sheet and then uh, analyzing it. It really is, is important for accuracy.
At least, at least, you know, to me. I mean, some people can feel it's not as much. But this also brings me to the understanding of how I see a difference between strong and weak thinkers. And I'm not saying this is like some sort of ad hominem or character attack. I'm just saying we ourselves should be aware of this and try to, to build this in ourselves and help others to build this. A strong thinker can deeply analyze their own positions, removing all that are unwanted, unwarranted, or undeserving, and updating to the most currently accurate information understanding. Whereas a weak thinker usually can only offer deep attacks to the positions of others that differ in their thinking. So we really need to understand that if you are feeling like you are a strong thinker, if you'd like to be a strong thinker, it requires that you challenge yourself. So just think, are your beliefs, ideas, your perceived truth, your perceived knowledge, are they further supporting rhetoric or accuracy? And I mean accuracy to the facts. And are you ready to change if you have it the other way around? In other words, what if you find out after looking that, that you have rhetoric? Are you truly willing to let some of it go? All of it go? How much, in fact, do you think is important to keep? Should we keep any? This also believes me. Uh, this also brings me to the the point of um, believers versus thinkers. Once again, I'm not trying to make an ad hominem attack against someone. I'm trying to do this to help you understand the different um, thinking strategies that we approach to analyzing things. I mean, some people are just hell bent to believe just almost everything without thinking other people and as I say, it's not that there's any to me anybody's not being a believer it's just that there's believers who believe blindly without thinking in a sense and there's thinkers who believe but think so when you can say with all honesty that you put a similar vigor to your own ideas as you demand of those of others, then you are truly being a thinker and not just a believer. And when you can quickly and eagerly relinquish any ideas or all ideas, even the most cherished ones, if they are not true, this, yes, this is willingness for the truth over ideas that are rhetoric. And yes, it's a willingness to discuss or discard if required. Even the things that you like. This is being a thinker and not just an unthinking believer. But then this brings us to another issue. Why is it so hard to be a thinker? and not just a believer. Well, there's a whole bunch of stuff I'm not going to go into. But let me just make it more clear. The reason that we have a massive problem, we love generalizations. The reason why this is important, because we like the thinking strategy of making the simplest action make the maximum amount of um, impact, in a sense. So I can see where this is... A, um, an easier way to transmit ideas, although it immediately means we're not being accurate. Now we need to be careful that we are being accurate because generalizations can quite often not be accurate. But see, we love generalizations even when they're wrong. And I'm not saying that I'm, you know, some perfect person that has no generalizations and doesn't love 
wrong generalizations that favor my position. I do, but the difference I'm trying to say is I keep saying stop allowing that to run my thinking. This is, I mean, we cannot avoid having any biases at all in our life. In fact, to think that we can, in a sense, is a bias of a, of a flawed belief in human perfection. Yeah, I don't believe in human perfection. I believe we're fallible, which makes me even more realize how important it is to be a thinker and not a believer. We don't like to show, it's like, we don't like to show clear and accurate thinking. We don't like slow thinking. We like fast, quick, hyper generalized thinking. And no, I'm not just trying to be biased against, you know, that somehow thinking is, is some kind of the greatest thing over belief. Beliefs can be valid, but it is not right to have unthinking beliefs. Because that opens you up to extreme chance of irrational biases. Now, irrational biases are dangerous. Not just to the people we don't like, but to us. Because, see, irrational biases are almost compulsive. Because they are a disorder of thinking in hasty generalizations that allows us to feel more easily um, able to grasp ideas, to be able to transmit ideas, and to be able to win arguments. I mean, hell, if all you have to do is beat the most easiest argument involved, well, then every argument becomes easier, straw manning the shit out of people. So, we need to not love generalizations. And I'm not saying we can never use them, but certainly we need to not have them be unthinking. See, we build our beliefs not on the accuracy of what they um, contain inside them or connected to, but often simply because they appeal to us. So we build our accuracy of our hasty generalizations one assertion at a time. In other words, we're not building accuracy. We're only building confidence. We add an undue, increase assurance to these hasty generalizations because we keep saying them over and over and over again. And you know how it is. You say a lie enough times it starts to sound true, including to ourselves. But it's not because it's actually accurate to the facts. See, I, you, me, we need to be careful thinkers, not just unthinking believers. We may want to, of course, cherry pick a few facts to support this error in thinking, which is hasty generalizations, but that is, and if, if it's in, done with the realization that now it's happening, is more an intellectual dishonesty than simply a logical fallacy. And I really try very hard to make sure that as much as I can, I keep assessing my thinking because I don't want to be intellectually dishonest even if it was on by accident. And I'm sure that there's things that I do that I can improve. But that's the point. I am looking to find them to try to improve. Something really we should all be doing. So I leave you not to think of how we can um, have only our position pushed, but how we should push true positions. Not how we can analyze others to, to make our position look better, but how we can analyze to find what is the true position. I really want to get out of just rhetoric and stereotypes 
rhetoric, rhetoric, rhetoric thinking in general, if it's only done to support a non-supportable idea, then it is not worthwhile. So we need to rethink then how we're thinking. And here's some information on hasty generalizations, <clears throat> which are also known as arguments of small numbers, statistics of small numbers, insufficient statistics, unrepresentative samples or forms of samples, arguments by generalization, faulty generalizations, hasty conclusions, or a form of conclusion, inductive generalization, insufficient samples, lonely fact fallacy, over generalizing. Okay, and in a description, think of it this way drawing a conclusion that is based on a small sample size rather than looking at the statistics that are much larger in line with more typical or an average situation than the extreme. It becomes extremely dishonest when you actually take the extreme and then try to position it or proposition it or express it as if it is the norm. So I hope that the, um, this has helped to uh, improve accuracy and I thank you for your time.